Trust is one of the most dangerous thresholds we manage in our lives. It can make or break the future. You have to trust in so much to move forward, and it's all about where you place it. We're seeing in One Piece crews how trust is broken and attacked, and some of the strongest crews have a level of trust devoted into something that cannot be shattered. For the Straw Hats, it's their belief in each other, but mostly in Luffy. For the Blackbeard Pirates, it seems that they put their trust in fate more than anything else. Fate and destiny being the drivers that brought them together. But what happens if that trust is shattered? Will Blackbeard just accept his downfall and not fight destiny? Are the people that fate and destiny brought to his side the ones he should trust? The reality is Blackbeard is facing several information leaks in his operation and I want to connect you to a bigger picture as to why it's important to track this information. So if you're new to the channel, the way I view the world is by making connections. So let me connect you to my vision, the PAR vision. With how efficient Blackbeard's crew has been operating throughout the Grand Line, it's easy for us to overlook some of the gaps and cracks in his Yonko operations. As far as the current Yonko go, it seems like Shanks and Blackbeard offer the most competent executive direction. And what I mean by that is that both of them seem to have been operating the longest with many factions of the world while managing really detailed planning within their own crews. In contrast, Luffy was essentially following a plan set out by Law during most of the time skip that was adjusted for the Whole Cake Island arc, but other than that, it's just straight ahead to the next shiny and fun island unless his friends are in danger. Buggy is also in a similar way just kind of moving upwards in a remarkable way obviously but after impelled down it was kind of like buggy was just continuously propelled by his environment the prisoners that he got were some of the most powerful pirates that can apparently survive the new world and were even recognized by whitebeard and even since then crocodile has been financing buggy's rise the entire time and a majority of the planning that went into what cross guild is currently was masterminded by crocodile and backed by mihawk in that way buggy and luffy aren't moving at the same level as blackbeard has and while that might change in the future with buggy's revived motivation to chase for the one piece which we covered in the last buggy video, it's more than clear how much of an establishment it is to be a Yonko. There is a reason why the world government cannot just allow loose agents and marines to attack a Yonko, and this rule goes all the way up to even the CP0. As we see when Kaku explains to Luchi that they have to stand down when confronted with the Straw Hat Pirates, and Stussy adding that yes, each emperor has an entire operation beneath them. A little skirmish here could lead to a war, which ironically happened afterwards. And that's the thing, with Blackbeard's operation in particular, it's curious how devoted his 10 Titanic commanders are to his cause. None of the other Yonko, and that is including Buggy, have a flimsy organization that could really hurt their respective leaders. Sure, they're all susceptible to betrayal, but not in the same way that Blackbeard is. Blackbeard didn't gain his crewmates the same way that the others did, and cutting these corners could lead to interesting gaps in how much pressure the crew can withstand in the future. We don't even know how Blackbeard knows his original starting crew of Burgess, Lafitte, and Van Auger. These are the guys who Blackbeard basically immediately picked up as soon as he betrayed Whitebeard and created his own crew. And as far as getting the point across, there is a reason why the 10 Titanic commander position was so volatile. All the theories that inserted various plot twists into this organization were all settled with this frontrunner choice of Kuzan. But even with Kuzan, a large part of the community thought at one point that Kuzan was doing a deep undercover mission, whether for himself or for S.W.O.R.D. The possibility of that is not negligible even still with how the Garp situation was resolved. I've talked about Kuzan's loyalty before, and honestly I'm still not certain which way that plotline will go down, but it's just another example of how unstable this group is. Their arguably second strongest member in Kuzan has a possibility of betrayal, and previous to him, I would place Shiryu second, and we have him debating disbanding if Blackbeard failed at Marineford, whereas I can't picture any other Yonko crew abandoning their captain after a failed mission, unless he meant if Blackbeard died there. And moving towards the time skip, we even see two years later, Burgess and Blackbeard discuss their trust in ex-Navy members and their crew, where Burgess was concerned about trusting Kuzan, and Blackbeard brought up Shiryu. And so, though we haven't got much of the crew, I'm not going to go as far to say that this crew is falling apart and completely not loyal to Blackbeard. I have an entire video about Blackbeard's crew dynamic and discussing how their efficiency and trust works. I did want to mention all of this though as a basis to analyze the weird scenario Blackbeard had during the Egghead arc. So while I'm not ready to immediately declare this person to be a traitor, we have to acknowledge that someone most likely from Blackbeard's crew leaked his position directly to Akainu during the fight against Law on Winner's Island. I think it's highly unlikely that someone on Law's crew did this, but at the same time, the timing of it is wild. While Blackbeard clashes with Law in Chapter 1064, we see a transition to Akainu getting an update from a Denden Mushi that says the Emperor Blackbeard made contact with Law. And from what we can tell, Winner's Island was an uninhabited island and there are only two crews here. Given how important information is right now, considering Blackbeard's operation, I think this is significant. Keep in mind, this is the only Yonko battle that never made an announced headline. We got Luffy's, Shanks, and Buggy updates, and while Blackbeard made it to the headlines for other things, this fight was never mentioned in the newspaper unlike Kid's situation and the others despite it being probably huge news, and yet we see a gang directly reported to the Navy, and for once, Morgans doesn't catch this news. All this making you wonder if it was intentionally planned by Blackbeard to do this. Maybe by announcing that Blackbeard was here, it was a way to fish out people who wanted to raid Pirate Island, namely Sword 
Lord and Garp, to which they left Kuzan as the man to play an ice cold defense, which could be possible, but on the other end, we'd be looking at a traitor situation. But out of the characters present on Winner's Island, I'm not sure who would do this. And maybe that's the wrong kind of thinking. Maybe instead, it would make sense to look at the characters that were not there, or rather not anywhere to be found during all of this chaos. I mean, some of you probably already know where I'm going with this, but isn't it suspect that ever since Dressrosa, we have yet to see Lafitte? You remember the cool mime-like demon sheriff that randomly has some kind of angelic wing sprout from his back? It makes sense if you forgot, because from the Whole Cake Island cover story update, Hachinosu during the Moria capture chapter, or the Kobe rescue mission. At Amazon Lily or Winner's Island, nor on Egghead, we have yet to get a Lafitte update. It's crazy, right? I normally love using process of elimination for my theory crafting, but here it still feels really shallow because we literally have no context here. We don't know why someone would tell a Kainu that this fight is happening. We don't know if they ever updated a Kainu that Law escaped or that Blackbeard essentially won. And we also don't know anything about Lafitte, really, but we sort of do and the little that we do know kind of would fit. So for example, one thing to note is that this path that Blackbeard is taking to collect bargaining chips to acquire world government status as a king is a similar path to his as a warlord. In that prior to becoming a warlord, Blackbeard used Ace as a bargaining chip to be granted that immunity status. And we know that without Lafitte, Blackbeard wouldn't have really been in the running for this spot because in chapter 234, we see one of the first major feats, even though this is generally a non-combative scene, is that Lafitte broke into and crashed a meeting in Marijuana that had Sengoku, the sitting fleet admiral, Suru, Doflamingo, Kuma, and Mihawk all present. He surprised them all by showing up, and some have even said that even Mihawk was caught off guard a little bit here. But the major thing is that that no matter how much I'd ever want to gas up Blackbeard or his crew, it would be silly to think that Lafitte here was anything more than an ant in a dragon's den, literally. Each one of these characters I listed should be able to instantly take care of pre-timeskip Lafitte, but they didn't. And so here is a situation where somehow Lafitte demonstrated his ability to get into contact with the Marines, because not only did he break in, he broke into the specific meeting where they were discussing replacing Crocodile as a warlord. And that's where Lafitte suggested Blackbeard and told him to just be patient because very soon they would acquire something that would make them remember their names, which was capturing Ace. We know that this isn't the last time they bargained with the Navy anyways. Fast forwarding a little bit past Marineford, we saw Blackbeard defeat Bonnie's crew and capture her and negotiated trading her for a Navy ship, which at the time Blackbeard was stripped of his warlord status and it ultimately led Akainu to them. But the point is that somehow they're able to facilitate these negotiations with the Navy. And that's what he wants to do right now with the world government and maybe Lafitte has been implanted there to forge this deal behind the scenes. And to further discuss this point, we have to recognize that Lafitte has demonstrated demonstrated abilities perfect to blend in with the Navy. During Marineford and Impel Down, he hypnotized the guards into opening the gates, so he has enough stealth to break into Marijuana and surprise top-tier characters and hypnotism adept enough to manipulate high-security Marine passes. He has contacted the Marines directly in the past in order to benefit Blackbeard, so maybe it could just be that Lafitte has been feeding Blackbeard information while inside the Marines' communication team, and that's how Blackbeard has been so on top of all of his plans. But it still wouldn't explain the whole purpose of telling Akainu at this moment, but something else to consider is that Lafitte is also involved in a definite leak within the Blackbeard's operations. I'm not saying it's him, but as far as the characters Oda's chose to involve, he was one of them. And so the situation I'm talking about is when Blackbeard destroyed the revolutionary headquarters on Baltigo. What we saw is that after Dressrosa, when Sabo left, he unknowingly brought Jesus Burgess as a stowaway back to his base. We don't have to discuss how comical it is that the loud, boisterous, and very difficult to hide Burgess was able to secretly stow away on the chief of staff's ship and never to be caught. That being said, the nuance here is that the revolutionary headquarters on Baltigo was hidden for about 30 years. The world's worst criminal dragon was able to hide away here for that long and even Burgess says that no one ever knew about this place and so he told the Blackbeard Pirates to follow his Viver card to save him and that they would be able to get a bunch of weapons. We have covered this several times before but again the emphasis point is that the way Baltigo was found was because Blackbeard's crew was able to follow a Viver card to Burgess. Without that Baltigo was hidden and so if anyone else found Baltigo they would have needed to follow Burgess's Viver cards and that's the ironic part. Somehow this is what was reported in chapter 824. It says that through an anonymous source the location of the Revolutionary Army headquarter was revealed, but by the time the Navy and Cypher Pool arrived, the Blackbeard Pirates had already leveled the settlement to the ground. It says Blackbeard clashed with Cypher Pool briefly before fleeing, but there was no info about fatalities in the article. So the question here is how did the Navy and Cypher Pool find out about all of this? Who is the anonymous source? And for that, we should look at who Burgess told this information to, and that was none other than Lafitte. Shiryu was also there, but Lafitte was the person Burgess spoke to. Now again, I'm not saying Lafitte is the traitor, even if he was the leak here. There's plenty of reasons to play both sides that I can 
think of, but I do find it ironic that the conversation that prefaced Burgess's involvement in Dressrosa was the call between him and Blackbeard discussing trusting Kuzan seemingly because he was an ex-Navy member, to which Blackbeard said, wouldn't that be the same for Shiryu? And the irony would be in this situation, Shiryu and Lafitte received the call from Burgess. And so if there was a leak, we should maybe suspect Shiryu, but instead, maybe Lafitte has been the sleeper Navy link that they should have been more paranoid about. He was the one who negotiated the warlord position with the Navy. He was the one that opened the Navy gates at Marineford. He was the one who received Burgess's call that ended up effectively being told to the Navy in Cypher Pole. And now when Blackbeard is making all of the moves all over the map, Lafitte is literally nowhere to be found. And during all this, Blackbeard's movements were leaked to Akainu somehow. And even if I wanted to think, maybe Shiryu and Kuzan did it, but they were preoccupied with Garb during the fight with Law on Winner's Island. All of this to say, I hope you enjoyed listening so far because these are some of the smaller videos that I'd love to connect with all of you on, but haven't had the time to. If you thought this was an interesting deep dive, please let me know in the comments and consider dropping a like and subscribing to the channel, especially to hear some of the bigger theories. And speaking of bigger theories, I do want to end this video discussing some of them around Lafitte. Now this video was kind of in my pocket for a long time. I decided to reduce it to an analysis piece rather than a full-blown theory piece over time because originally this script was a theory claiming that Lafitte is an ex cypher pole agent. That could explain how Lafitte managed to get into marriage Roi and know all the marine security systems. This would have made Lafitte extremely knowledgeable of the world's secrets and not to mention he has the stealthy spy profile of a cypher pole agent. He even kind of has the uniform. I was thinking if Lafitte was cypher pole then his epithet as the demon sheriff could have stemmed from a time that was similar to Lucci's past epithet of a massacre weapon. Both dark and sinister titles, but permissible considering it would have been under Cypher Pole. And I believe this is a low stake theory that could easily become possible, especially since we know an ex Cypher Pole member was in Kaido's crew with Who's Who. So why couldn't it be that Lafitte be that for Blackbeard? But this theory ended up spiraling out to a crazier theory where maybe Lafitte wasn't just any old Cypher Pole agent, but instead Hattori. Yeah, crazy, right? Hattori being the bird on Luchi's shoulder. Which, by the way, when Oda designed Luchi, he wasn't Luchi, he was the Pigeon Guy. It wasn't until later when Oda established the Pigeon Guy as the primary villain in the Ennis Lobby arc that he became Luchi. That being said, I'm not off the ship that Lafitte is secretly Hattori. My mods and some of my members who have attended my streams probably remember me discussing this a long time ago. And since then, several theories have cropped up, so I'll link you to all of the ones I know of. I do know that some of my details extend past some of these theories, but I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing a theory not from me. If you want me to cover my perspective of the theory let me know, but I will say something to heavily consider is that Hattori and Lafitte have never been in the same room together. And I know that's a meme reason, but if we were to say that they were the same person then the easiest way to discredit the idea is to look at if they ever overlap at all in the story, and they do not. Which remember we said how crazy it was that despite how much the Blackbeard Pirates are in the story right now, we have no Lafitte updates. But wouldn't it make sense if that was the case because Hattori has been present through most of the recent story. Hattori disappears from Luchi during fights, but think about it, Hattori has been present to all of the world events recently that Blackbeard has been getting the drop on almost early in some cases. Check my other Blackbeard video discussing how Blackbeard has been early to nearly everything in the timescape before even the headlines, but the point is I honestly don't think it'd be that crazy if Lafitte was Hattori. There are some Viver card details in the past that kind of jumble this up admittedly, but as of recently due to how Oda has been changing Viver card information in a major way, like that of Saul being declared dead in the Viver cards and yet he is well alive in the manga right now, is a good example of how Oda might not hold Viver card details high enough to not steer the story differently, if the opportunity presents itself at least. That being said, the only time Hattori and Lafitte do have crossover is in Dressrosa. Ironically, Lafitte says a very interesting line to Burgess that said he went to Dressrosa and searched for Burgess. If he had Shiryu there, between both of them they would be stealthy enough to hide, especially if Shiryu had the invisibility fruit by then, but it would be kind of crazy for a Blackbeard ship to show up while the navy had an admiral, a former fleet admiral, and Suru, and not be scouted during Dressrosa's arc. And so so the crossover is that Luchi was in Dressosa, and we do see Hattori on the island. He is with Luchi. And this is just two chapters before we see Lafitte talking to Burgess about raiding the Revolutionary Army headquarters. And guess what Hattori would have overheard? It was that the Revolutionary stole all the weapons and contraband from the underground warehouse that Doflamingo had, and the cipher pole was trading. So it would be crazy if this was a literal two birds one stone situation, except that the two birds was just the same bird. I do have my own counter to the theory, but we have been talking about the possibility that Hattori was secretly a major character for a long time, even predating the Hattori for Lafitte waves. So I'm not sure where I land on this, but if I think it's possible for Lafitte to be an ex cypher pole agent, I can actually fathom this crazy plot twist that Lafitte is Hattori and vice versa. But I do want to shout out what some 340,000 people would say is the greatest Lafitte theory ever made that offers a wildly different potential for Lafitte by the Hidden Island. Now I don't want to spoil his video for you, but I will give you an idea I had when he first told me about it. It was that if you combine this 
conversation and the Hidden Islands theory, it would make it be that Lafitte could have been a huge mastermind of the God Valley incident specifically discussing the treasure stolen from Hachinosu. But I'll leave it there for now. I got more ideas to share with you in the future. Let me know what you think about Lafitte and the potential data leaks that Blackbeard has had in the comments down below. And so, like always, thank you for connecting with me, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you all on the next part vision.